ladies and gentlemen. A long time ago, Abraham Lincoln made a statement. To sin by silence when you should speak out makes cowards of men. It's time we spoke out about Vietnam and the most obvious yet the most ignored threat ever faced by free people in the history of the world. The street demonstrators demand that we get out of Southeast Asia so that there will be peace. Where do they get the idea that there will be peace just because we quit? We can't stop the war by giving up. And we sure can't settle anything by trying to bargain with a winning enemy at the peace table. This is a war that was going on a long time before Vietnam. It'll go on whether we pull out or not. We can't stop the war by giving up. And the way it is now, we're not programmed to win because of the politicians and civilians that we've let stick their nose in it. Listen to this young fella. I'm flying helicopters commercially in Alaska now. Not long ago, I was flying them in Vietnam. I was there to fight the communists and try to win. But our politicians wouldn't let us. What kind of a war is this that we're not supposed to win? Truth of the matter is, it's not a separate war at all. It's only one battle in a bigger, long, drawn-out attack that's been going on for over 50 years. And it's a war we're losing, not only on battlefields, but out on street corners, college campuses, in the offices of some of our most influential so-called statesmen. Now, all men of goodwill certainly want peace. But do we want peace at any price, peace without freedom? We all know that this country has, with goodwill, has stumbled a few times and made a mistake or two. We can't go back and do anything about that. But as Mr. Lincoln once said, I wish I'd been there when the horse was stole, but I reckon I can find the tracks when I do get there. Seems to me the horse is already stole, so we better get back and pick up the tracks. To give you that background, we have a man who really knows. Someone who was there when all the important history was being made since World War I. He has the facts firsthand. Here he is. A great newspaper man, Mr. Lowell Thomas. Hello, everybody. This is Lowell Thomas chat with you for a moment about what we all seem to agree is just about the most important subject of our time. And to those of you who are fairly young, perhaps it is more important to you than to the rest of us. I'm sure you all remember the words of the father of our country, George Washington, who was a fairly wise man. He said, the best way to prepare for peace is to be ready for war. World War I was the beginning of what the whole of mankind hoped would lead to a permanent world peace. It seems like the height of folly now, hard for us to understand, impossible in fact to comprehend. But after the war was over, the Allies began to disband their armies, break up their navies, and melt down their guns. In the confusion at the end of World War I, a group of dedicated men came to power in Russia. The leader of the group, Nikolai Lenin, head of the Bolshevik, or majority communist party. He knew the free nations of the world desperately wanted peace. He also knew his ideology, communism, could use this as a tool against them. Part of his plan to achieve worldwide supremacy was to instruct communist followers in all countries to protest for peace. A disarmed nation, then, would be ripe for plucking. As soon as hostilities ceased at the end of World War I, the Allies, who had stopped the Kaiser's war machine, stopped it cold. Alas, they began to disband their armies and navies. After all, Germany had been the only nation with ambitions to expand, and Germany was smashed for good. Or was it? No one at the peace tables had ever heard of a lance corporal in one of the Bavarian regiments, a chap known as Adolf Schickelgruber, later to be known as Adolf Hitler. It's hard to believe that a lowly lance corporal with a funny mustache could ever get far, but in less than 15 years, there he was, head of a rearmed Germany, with plans to conquer the world. Distinguished men like the Lone Eagle, Charles Lindbergh, and the fabulous Jimmy Doolittle told us what was going on in Central Europe, told us what Hitler was doing. 
and we paid little or no attention. Ah, oh, but life was too dear and peace too sweet to rock the boat. So few raised a hand to do anything at the time. So in 1938, with the most powerful war machine in the world up to that time, Hitler marched on Austria. The next year, 1939, he marched on Czechoslovakia. Now, England began to get the message. We all know how Chamberlain went from London to Munich with his umbrella and came back saying, this means peace in our time. But no sooner had this conference been concluded than Hitler made a pact with Russia. And then they both attacked Poland. The next step was the Blitz on the West. With the Nazis, and the communists in collusion, their representatives here in America stepped up their propaganda and began shouting to us, disarm, disarm. No harm will ever come to America. Meanwhile, peace talks had so reduced US power that when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, you all remember that some of our old battleships lined up there, either were sunk or beached. And we had, for all practical purposes, lost our Pacific fleet. It appeared as though it was almost too late. But we did get down to the agonizing business of rebuilding for a counterattack. And the history books show that in spite of all obstacles, we finally, we finally did win. After that followed those usual negotiations between the winner and the loser. But even while we were winning, certain American leaders, perhaps fooled by Stalin, they arranged things so we lost nearly as much as we gained, possibly more. As our troops rushed in triumph through Germany, they got the word to slow down, slow down. Let the Russians move in. Let the Russians take over East Germany, take over the great city of Berlin. Today, a nation of people who love communism so well that they have to be walled in and kept in with guns, they are a tragic monument to those people who seek to appease the enemy. In meetings at Yalta with Lenin's cunning successor, Stalin, the Russians managed to take over all of Eastern Europe, much of Asia. We know what happened in the Far East and how they put it over on China. And so the stage was set for Korea. And a little later on, for Vietnam. In 1945, everybody thought the war was over. But our real enemy was still going strong. This was a so-called ally that we had let take East Germany and Berlin. Now, I'm not speaking of the Russian people, and I won't speak of the Chinese people. I'm speaking of the communist conspiracy. So many of the great Americans of the last generation are no longer with us to give us the first-hand account of what happened behind the scenes, behind the false front of communist cooperation after the war. We are fortunate that one of the greatest leaders, the conqueror of the Nazis, in Italy, is here and can tell it like it was when it came to getting along with the Reds. This is General Mark Clark. After the end of World War II, when the fighting stopped in Italy and I took the surrender of the German forces there, I went into Austria as the American occupation commander and high commissioner. 
Russian armies were there in Austria as well. And I sat on a quadripartite meeting with the Russians and the British, the French and ourselves, in order to implement the agreement that the nations had made at Potsdam, which was to bring about free and independent and democratic Austria once more. Saw firsthand the duplicity of the Soviets, how they looted, killed, murdered, and that they couldn't be believed. I found that every constructive move and suggestion we made to help Austria was vetoed by the Soviets. Then I went with Burns to the Conference of Foreign Ministers in England and then with Marshall into Moscow. And there again, I saw the difficulty, the almost impossibility of doing business with the Russians unless you do it from a position of extreme force and you never compromise and you never show weakness. For where they see weakness, they despise it and exploit it. And when they see strength and determination, that's when they sit up and take notice. In the aftermath of the war, the Reds managed to grab off East Germany and all the countries that are now on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain. And for the next big move to encircle the world, they looked east to Asia. There are a lot of garbled accounts of what really happened when the East began to go red. But we have the number one authority with us who can give it to us straight. This is a man who's more familiar with Asian communism than anyone else in America today. He is General Albert C. Wedemeyer, former U.S. commander in the Far East. He sat and listened to Mao Zedong tell how they, the Reds, were going to take over China. The general warned the State Department at that time that we should support Chiang Kai-shek if we didn't want the biggest country in the world with 700 million people to be lost to communism. Unfortunately, nobody was listening. Well, listen to him now, General Albert C. Wedemeyer. I have spent 10 years in the Orient, living in China, the Philippines, and in India. Experiences and observations in those areas provide the basis for my ideas and suggestions about the Vietnam War at the close of World War II. The Soviet Union accelerated plans for the conquest of the Far East. In 1946, the Republic of China, Japan, and Thailand were the only independent nations in that area. Moscow planned to exploit the industrial know-how of Japan, the vast pool of manpower in China, and the natural resources in Southeast Asia, the Philippines, Indonesia, and the Melanesian Islands. During General MacArthur's wise and courageous administration, communist efforts to communize Japan were successfully blocked. The Soviet Union then turned its attention to mainland China. With the connivance of the Red Chinese leaders, Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai, mainland China, an area greater in extent than the United States, and 700 million people were drawn within the orbit of the Soviet Union in 1949. The loss of China to the tyranny of communism was a black mark on the escutcheon of the United States. Instead of supporting our loyal World War II ally, Chiang Kai-shek, the United States government adopted a hands-off policy, which was dramatized by the then Secretary of State's announcement, quote, we will let the dust settle out there, end of quote. You and I know that the dust was settled in Korea and is now being settled in Vietnam with American blood. Chiang Kai-shek were compelled to withdraw to Formosa, where they maintained a strong bastion against communist advance. I believe then, and do now, that we should have continued our support of the strongly anti-communist government of nationalist China. Had we done so, the United States would not today experience an uneasy peace in Korea and a costly war in Vietnam. Of course, the next communist move in their continuous war on the free world was Korea. And after General MacArthur was pulled out for being too tough on the commies, General Mark Clark was ordered to Korea to pick up the pieces. He soon found out he was faced again with the same old problems when it came to dealing with the Reds. General Mark Clark. President Truman sent me out to the Far East take command during the Korean War, the last year and a half. And there I saw them again. I saw them this time on the field of battle, 
I saw how treacherous they were, how they murdered our prisoners of war, and how they could not be relied upon to carry out any of their promises or live up to the rules of the Geneva Convention concerning prisoners or conduct of war. The so-called Korean War was the first evidence since the pullback from Berlin of a no-win policy. Apparently, Hitler was the last enemy we were supposed to put up a fight against. General Clark found out that he had to try to wage war with one or maybe both hands tied. The fighting was severe at that time. The Chinese had entered the war, and there were many limitations that were placed upon me as the commander-in-chief. I could not hit, for example, the bridges over the Yellow River, over which the killers came with their paraphernalia, their ammunition, their tanks, and whatnot to kill our men. It seemed to me that that was completely wrong, that we should not take out those bridges, and that would uh, make it more difficult for the enemy to maintain his position in the field. We were not able to hit the city of Pyongyang because there were munition plants that were hidden within it. We did not hit certain power plants that provided power for North China and Manchuria. But in spite of all the difficulties, a kind of peace was finally arranged in Korea. We'd never heard of a place called Vietnam, which was to be the next red battle in their long war against the free world. Vietnam was then a part of the French colonial possession known as Indochina. The reports were that the Indochinese were fighting for independence from the French. This may have been so, but it was also a good excuse for a communist takeover to switch the ruling powers from France to the Red. The so-called revolution was headed by a character with a funny beard and an unfunny reputation as a terrorist. His name was Ho Chi Minh. He was what the historians call a dedicated revolutionary. Ho was born in 1890 and was a communist even as a young man. He was so active that he helped form the French Communist Party in 1920. All during the 30s, the Kremlin used him to ferment trouble in the Orient and aided him in building up a fanatic following. When he died in 1969, the London Daily Telegraph debunked the picture of Ho as a simple patriot, I quote. There are always men who, for one reason or another, will rhapsodize on the qualities of even the worst tyrant. Ho Chi Minh's record for cold-blooded and often bestial murder of men, women, and children ranks him beside Hitler and Stalin for sheer atrocity, unquote. Now, during Ho's career, he was paraded around the communist world, where the masses were trotted out to give him a big reception wherever he went. He was feted by such redliners as India's Krishna Menon, of course, by the then big boss of communism, Nikita Khrushchev, as well as all the secondary world wheels of the party. Ho made his biggest effort at a place called Dien Bien Phu, where he besieged the French army. The United States was asked to bring an airstrike in against red positions. The United States refused. In any event, the French cause was probably doomed because the leftist French government forced their army to fight a no-win war as General Clark had been forced to fight in Korea. So Ho was able to inflict a humiliating defeat on the French. At the Geneva Peace Conference, which followed, it was agreed that Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam would be independent nations. However, Vietnam was partitioned temporarily and the two areas divided by the 17th parallel the North area to be under the control of the communist stooge Ho Chi Minh, and the South to be under the former French puppet Bao Dai. Immediately after the Geneva Conference, Ho Chi Minh and his Viet Cong followers launched an extensive and brutal campaign of subversion and guerrilla action. More than 50,000 South Vietnamese, including village officials, teachers, merchants, and law enforcement officers were kidnapped, mutilated, or killed by the Viet Cong guerrillas. Too often, our own information media, TV, radio, and the press, are responsible for a wide-held impression that the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong are the good guys. And we, the South Vietnamese, the South Koreans, and Americans, 
are the bad guys. The redliners from all countries had a ball castigating the United States. But no one ever complains about the almost daily Viet Cong mortaring of towns and the killing of civilians. Well, anyway, to give you an idea of how popular Ho and his crowd were after they kicked out the French, the Geneva Conference gave all Vietnamese 300 days to go either north or south to the red or non-red areas. Word of this opportunity to make a choice was supposed to be circulated in every village and town in the land. While Ho understandably made no effort to broadcast this information, over 1,200,000 people who found themselves in the communist north streamed south to freedom below the 17th parallel. This rush was still in progress when the 300 days were up and Ho dropped the bamboo curtain. But in spite of the fact that he lowered the boom on them, officially, the continual defection of North Vietnamese and defection from the supposedly dedicated Viet Cong goes on to this day. From before 1960, U.S. advisors were aiding the South Vietnamese. We had in the area what was known as the Military Assistance Command. We are fortunate to be able to hear from a man who was in charge almost from the beginning, General Paul Harkin. From February 8, 1962 until June 1964, I was the commander of the United States Military Assistance Command in Vietnam. In that capacity, I commanded all the United States forces in South Vietnam, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and Marines. We had no combat, American combat troops in Vietnam at that time. Our role was strictly advisory. In that capacity, we trained the Army, Navy, and Air Force of the Vietnamese Armed Forces. You have probably heard people say that the United States shouldn't be over there in the first place, that it's an immoral war, that we are there illegally. The record shows that after the partition of Vietnam, President Eisenhower promised the government of South Vietnam all possible aid. At the Geneva Conference, the North Vietnamese agreed not to molest people south of the 17th parallel. But when the Viet Cong started infiltrating and slaughtering village leaders, administrators, and school teachers, the president of South Vietnam asked for our help. He didn't ask Russia. He didn't ask Communist China. He asked the United States of America if we could assist in stopping communist aggression and helping build up the resources of his country. This is when my headquarters, the Military Assistance Command, was established. The South Vietnamese didn't have quite enough forces to protect all the villages at once. And we started in 1961 what we called the Strategic Hamlet Program, which simply meant a trained local force to protect the local people from communist infiltration. For the American advisors, the situation was frustrating in the extreme. They would aid a village in building a school, and on the first dark night, the Viet Cong guerrillas would destroy it by mortar fire, with mortars made in Russia or communist China. In the back country, other Americans were helping to distribute food, medicine, and needed supplies. Special forces played an active part in training the South Vietnamese soldiers, as well as the mountain yard people in the highlands. The special forces, a new unit in our services, is called the Green Berets. One of the best known of these is Sergeant Barry Sadler. We have a big job in Vietnam. The villagers in both the Mekong and the Highlands are constantly threatened by the Viet Cong and their North Vietnamese allies, and often recruited into their armed forces, sometimes with use of propaganda, promises, lies. When that fails, they don't hesitate to use force, terrorism, even to butchering entire villages as an example to those who won't listen to their friendly persuasion. And when they use force, they use these. Modern weapons made in communist China and the Soviet Union. They're communist allies. I spent a great deal of my time in Vietnam working as a medic. I worked in the villages with the people. And they needed help. And over a period of years, the health of these people has been greatly improved by the U.S. medics in the field. 
You can't get to really know the people of Vietnam by staying around Saigon. Saigon's a big city with four and a half million people in it. And with worse traffic than you'll find in New York. The marketplaces are crowded and filled with black market goods. Everything from American coffee to opium. And like all cities in a war zone, the profiteers are after the buck. But south of Saigon lies the Delta. 28,000 square miles of the richest rice land in the world. Rice land the communists want. Here's a housewife out catching poisonous snakes for the family dinner and glad to get them. Where the Viet Cong mortared or burned a village, we came in to collect the refugees and ferry them to a new, more secure area. One that was safe from the guerrillas, at least for the time being. Of course, the roads were mined or under possible mortar attack, and the villagers had to be moved in airborne operations. And everything went, including burial urns, which contained the ashes of their ancestors because these people always carry their dead with them. More and more aircraft were needed. But as we seem to be getting somewhere, it so infuriated the communists that they stepped up their attacks on these unarmed innocent people. Whole villages were burned to the ground. Farmers were mortared and machine gunned in their rice paddies while trying to gather their crops. The attacks became more and more vicious and fanatical. It seemed incredible, but the knowledge of these terror tactics didn't inflame the free world against the communists. But unbelievably, criticism of our operations began to mount. It was frustrating for a soldier, halfway around the world fighting a war, and it seemed like the enemy was the good guy in the white hats. It was as if the American public were only getting the information the Reds wanted them to. In fact, I'd say the press had been more help to the enemy than a fresh division. To the Americans in the mid-60s, the situation really became explosive. Though the troops were told to avoid combat, we were losing more and more advisors all the time. In the summer of 64, some of our destroyers were patrolling in the Gulf of Tonkin, and two of them were fired upon by North Vietnamese gunboats. A man who was in a unique position to see the whole thing develop is Admiral U.S. Grant Sharp, former Commander-in-Chief of Pacific Operations. Admiral Sharp. In early 1965, President Johnson decided that U.S. combat troops were necessary in South Vietnam to keep the country from being overrun by the communists. So that is how it started. Our objectives are clear and honorable. They are simply to prevent the success of North Vietnamese aggression to prevent Viet Cong terror and to allow the country to live in peace and freedom. While our objectives are correct, the methods we have used to achieve them leave much to be desired. We inserted our forces piecemeal and then, worst of all, we never used our tremendous air and naval power effectively. Before the Admiral goes on, notice that just as with the Berlin pullback in World War II and the hamstringing of the military during the Korean mess, the no-win policy dictated by behind-the-scene powers in Washington is again in force and has been ever since President Kennedy committed us to this no-win conflict. From the beginning, we should have closed the harbor of Haiphong and prevented all the vital imports from reaching that area. Instead, we permitted them to import all the necessities of war without any uh, difficulties whatsoever, despite the fact that we control the seas. This was a great mistake, of course, and immeasurably increased the casualties that our side incurred. One of the best features of a naval blockade or a blockade by mining is that there are very few casualties involved. The country uh, which is blockaded against simply doesn't get the supplies they need, and thus their capacity to fight is greatly reduced. Whenever we fight the communists, they seem to have help from somebody on our side. Somebody always wants to bend over backwards to avoid getting tough with them. 
doing them any damage. I can't figure this as an innocent attitude, especially since the Reds tell us continually exactly what they're going to do. Now, Lenin said war is simply a continuation of politics by other means. He's admitting that if they can't convert you by peaceful means, they'll just switch to violence and pull a gun on you. He also said something else in that book. He said that the existence of, of the Soviet Republic side by side with the United States is unthinkable. One or the other must triumph in the end. Now, Lenin's school of political warfare in Moscow teaches that war is to the hilt between communism and the free world. It is inevitable. Now, don't take my word for it. Just get one of these books and read it for yourself. If you want to know how they're doing so far, let's take a look. They have East Europe. They're around to Cuba on one side and getting ready to break out in Korea on the other and about to wear us to a nub in Vietnam. Well, the patience of a nation or a fighting man will wear out. If your own side won't let you win, since that's what the Reds want, it makes you wonder who's controlling our destiny. The boys on the firing line are the most frustrated of all. Listen to a man who not long ago was flying a gunship in Vietnam. We were never really allowed to go on the offensive. We were constantly clearing out areas, only to let the Viet Cong go back in as soon as we had moved out. On the search and destroy missions, we would burn up an area with lead or lay down a base of fire, as the term is. Then the troops were lifted in. The boys would be landed and take off into the brush after the Viet Cong. When the guys on the ground were at work, the expression, smoking them out, was an appropriate description of how they operated. Later, after they'd swept the area, we'd come back and pick them up and fly them back to the base. It would be anywhere from two days to two months. One thing great about the chopper, we would be able to get the wounded to the hospital in a matter of minutes. We ranged the Delta looking for infiltrators, but the trouble was, just as in the city streets, the markets are on the waterfront, the North Vietnamese and the South Vietnamese look alike, and you can't tell them apart until it's too late. The sampans below contain concealed guerrilla terrorists, armed to the teeth and loaded down with grenades. Our night photo planes told us that during the night they had slipped in from Cambodia, but due to the political restrictions, we couldn't hit them. One thing bad about the war, we couldn't shoot until they fired at us first. A lot of my buddies never got a chance to fire back. It's tough when a politician has a hold of your trigger finger. Sometimes we found their boats hidden in marshy areas, covered with reeds. These were destroyed because the area was off limits to the local populace. Once the troops uncovered an ammunition assembly plant, the troops found a lot of grenades and explosives with Chinese markings, the products of munitions factories in Red China. When an area became heavily overrun with Viet Cong, we would pinpoint them and call in the Air Force. With our let the enemy shoot first policy, we saved a lot of American lives by not having to drop our ground soldiers into the hot spots. But the bearded, bleeding hearts at home and lefty politicians soon put a stop to this. I guess we weren't supposed to hurt the enemy. The kind of war we were forced to fight was bound to get us nowhere. But worst of all, the guys on the ground might take an area or a hill with great loss of blood and life. They would have to withdraw and might have to take it all over again three months later. We all felt more and more frustrated as time went by. Now I can understand why so many of the people at home wanted us to call it quits and bring the troops home. Most Americans at home are honestly concerned. But unlike any other war that we were ever involved in, we have a communist-inspired front in our streets working on the sympathies of a lot of honest people. They claim they're simply going all out for peace, while a lot of them burn the American flag, stamp it into the ground while waving the flag of the Viet Cong, who have tortured and killed tens of thousands of innocent civilians, whose only crime was that they resisted joining the Red Ranks. Would you call a person who 
fact, the enemy, a peace advocate, or a member of the enemy's forces? Well, someone who backs our forces, who has traveled to Vietnam many times, who has gone to all the combat zones to entertain the fighting men, and one of the best-loved stars of the American public is Martha Ray. She can tell it like it is. Martha Ray. Thank you, Duke. From one Green Beret to another. I have just returned from my eighth trip overseas with our troops. And I'm now preparing for my ninth trip. Let's say get my gear together. To go back over with my family. And they're also your family, too. Our troops are shocked at the attitude of college officials and others who stoutly maintain there is no organized direction to the rowdyism. That all the demonstrations are spontaneous and unorganized. You may rest assured, these servicemen are not deceived. The Reds have declared in no uncertain terms that they are going to destroy the morale, character of a generation of young Americans. And when they have finished, there will be nothing left for us to defend ourselves against them. And they're doing a pretty thorough job on some of our kids. And while this is happening, they won't let us defend ourselves in the manner that all great military minds advocate. To attack, strike the enemy in his own territory. We keep coming back to this as the central problem in our war on communism. Let Admiral Sharp tell it to you the way he saw it. The major problem was that we were restricted in the targets that we could hit. We started in the southern part of North Vietnam and gradually worked north, with the result that the North Vietnamese, with the Soviets' assistance, were permitted to build up their defenses around Hanoi and Haiphong. So that when our planes eventually got into the Hanoi, Haiphong area, they were met by the most concentrated and accurate air defenses that any country has ever faced. Even so, with the very heavy defenses and with the restrictions on our air attacks, we were still able to damage North Vietnam to the extent that in the fall of 1967, they were in great difficulty. Had we been allowed to go on in 1968 and hit the targets that needed to be hit and keep the targets down that we had already hit, the war would certainly have been over by the end of 1968. If you aren't sufficiently convinced by the Admiral, listen to one of the Navy bomber pilots. I think I'm speaking for 99% of all the men that have been to Vietnam, whether in a flying status or on the ground, when I say that it's one of the most frustrating experiences a man, particularly a fighting man, could go through. I think I can say that all of us who went over there, and I know all of us that were together in my particular group, went over there with a an exhilarated feeling that they were going to go into battle and do the job that had to be done. They were going to be allowed to get to the target. And of course, we always go in with the feeling that we want to help the men on the ground as much as we can. And we do this by bombing the necessary targets, the logistics lines, the munitions dumps, the petroleum stations that prevent the enemy from getting this stuff down into South Vietnam and using it against our men and our allies, the South Vietnamese. But it wasn't long until we realized that because of the political restrictions that were placed upon this particular war, it was to be similar to the Korean War, only probably worse. And that we were not allowed to get to these targets that we knew were necessary targets and vital targets to destroy them and to prevent these supplies and enemy equipment and enemy soldiers from getting into South Vietnam. We knew that they were going down there. We knew how they were getting down there. We knew where the targets were. But there was so much frustration in that when we came back and we told the people back on the carriers, the air intelligence people, the Admiral's War Room, that these targets were there, that we'd like to go bomb them, they were just as frustrated as we were because they had to then send a message back to Washington to get permission to bomb these targets. And this permission never came. I recall when they were first setting up the missile sites over there. The missiles at that time had been used against American aircraft flying over North Vietnam. But we came back and told the responsible people on the carrier that these missile sites were going up, that we could see them down there, they were getting prepared, that we ought to go back and bomb them. Well, once again, 
Our hands were tied, the Admiral's hands were tied. They had to go back to Washington through channels with a message. And the message came back, no, we could not bomb the missile site until the time came that two of our planes were shot down with these missiles on a night mission or an early evening mission. Uh, the whole thing was they tried to give the indication that they had not known ahead of time that these missile sites were there. And of course, this is frustrating to a man to see his friends, roommates, the people that he has gone through training with go down in a situation knowing full well that it could have been prevented long before had the politicians allowed you to do so. Now, when I say restrictions, once again, I say restrictions such as these. We could fly over enemy airfields where the planes were sitting on the airfield. We knew what they were there for, but we couldn't harm them. These same planes could come up behind our aircraft and shoot them down and climb back down on the deck, and we were not permitted to go after them once they got to that airfield. There was even such a restriction at the particular time that I was there that you could not shoot an enemy aircraft until he had fired at you, which is to say that if he didn't shoot you down first, then you had a chance at him. I wish that some of the liberal senators had taken a negative stand in this situation to promote their own political ambitions, could be put in the same spot as our boys overseas, with one arm tied behind them, or maybe two, to face this treacherous enemy. One time we couldn't, we couldn't bomb convoys. Finally, we were cleared to go on these particular targets, but only so long as they were on a roadway. It doesn't matter if you knew that this particular convoy was carrying munitions, uh, supplies, going into South Vietnam. We knew their routes. We knew, we knew where they were going, down Route 1, uh, through Magia Pass. And as far as bomb shortages at that time, Mr. McNamara, who was Secretary of Defense, was decrying that there was no substance to the information that we, that we were experiencing a shortage of bombs, aircraft, or flyers in the Vietnam area. And Congressman Mitchell had been on the carrier and had personally seen these missions where we were taking off, loading with maybe one-fifth the bomb load an aircraft that could carry 24 of this particular type bomb. We were carrying maybe four of these bombs. On some days, instead of carrying bombs to a target that clearly called for bombs, we'd be carrying rockets. And when you'd ask your deck officer why we were doing this, he would say, because we don't have enough bombs to last the rest of the month if we carry them all on every load or if we load the planes fully. So it was obvious to us that we were sending out five planes on a mission or four planes that were loaded with maybe a fourth or a fifth of a load of bombs when we could have sent one or two planes with a full load and gotten the same job done with a minimum risk of lives and equipment. Of course, you're talking about a three and a half million dollar aircraft in case you're not interested in the lives involved. But, it, but this is the thing that was frustrating to us, you see. It, 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 our only concern was that we could get in and be allowed to do the job. When you send men into war, you should send them in there with the idea that they're risking their lives and for risking those lives, they should be allowed to do the job to take the action that's necessary to minimize the risk of their lives and to get to the enemy and get the job done in a minimum amount of time and get back to their homes and their families where they want to be. And this hasn't been done in Vietnam. And the only way that we're going to come to a, to a successful conclusion over there is to defeat the enemy. Just as bad as the no-win restriction, maybe worse, is the policy of helping the enemy to get goods and munitions with which to defeat it. Does that sound idiotic? Well, listen to a young Green Beret named Peter Stark who lost both legs below the knees in Vietnam. The only way to break communist will is to break the communist back. To do this, you must eliminate their access to that material which they need to wage the war. You must eliminate their means. The United States has never significantly attempted to eliminate their means of war with which they kill American soldiers in South Vietnam. We have assured their main supplier of war goods, the Soviet Union, and its satellite nation, its colonies, which supplies 80% of all the North Vietnamese war material. We have assured the Soviet bloc countries that we will not interfere in their shipment of war goods to the North Vietnamese enemy. At the same time that we have assured them we will not interfere with this shipment, we have continued our policy of trading with the Soviet bloc, of sending strategic materials to the Soviet enemy. For example, in 1966, the United States sent the Soviet Union 
the entire technical specification which they needed to build a glycerol plant. Glycerol is used in the manufacture of explosives. I think everybody's heard of nitroglycerin. Specifically in Vietnam, glycerol is used as a detonator and booby trap. Over 50% of all American casualties suffered in South Vietnam have come from booby traps. I do not think it can be satisfactorily explained to a man who has lost his eyesight because of a booby trap. Or to the parents of a man who has been killed on a booby trap in South Vietnam. Why the government that sent this man to South Vietnam refuses to interfere not only with the enemy receiving this type of weapon, but actually helps the enemy to produce it. A screaming example, late 1969, we loaned Sweden $50 million. Early 1970, Sweden loans $45 million directly to NOI. For those of us who have been there, Vietnam is not a phony war. It was and is a very real war. It is not a limited war because there is no such thing as limited death. We're glad to have fought in Vietnam for the United States of America and for freedom of the South Vietnamese people. Many of my friends, your sons, your husbands, your brothers, and in some cases your fathers, have died fighting the communist enemy in Asia. You should be very proud of these men. They were good men. They died young for the freedom of others. No more can be asked from any man. They were willing to fight because they know that on that day, that Americans are not willing to fight for their freedom. On that day, America will no longer have its own freedom. Many people have not been informed of the fact that Vietnam is more than just an isolated brush fire war halfway around the world. It has a much deeper meaning than that. Vietnam is one battle in a war for the world. It is a battle we are losing, not on the field of battle, but here at home. The Soviet empire is expanding. The communists are deathly serious about their stated goal of world conquest. They are as serious as Hitler and his National Socialist Party were about world conquest. All Americans must remember that the Soviet enemy is only 20 minutes away by rocket. Finally, there was a great hue and cry to get the Reds to the so-called peace table. After all proof to the contrary over the years, some people still believed you could talk the Reds out of taking over our country. Now, to get the enemy to talk peace, you usually bear down hard on him so that he's had enough and wants to get out. Not us, not our State Department, not our Defense Department. We did just the opposite. We made it easy on the communists by stopping the bombing altogether. Let Admiral Sharp comment on that. Then, in March of 1968, it was decided to halt the bombing of the vital areas of North Vietnam in order to entice the Vietnamese to come to the conference table to negotiate a peace. Before the North Vietnamese even got to the conference table and started negotiating, we had stopped all bombing of North Vietnam. So here was a country with tremendous air power allowing an adversary to fight from a sanctuary. Were the communists going to negotiate under those conditions? Certainly not. They were going to delay meaningful negotiations, hoping that our natural impatience to end the war would get the better of us, and we would make concessions to them which would result in victory for their side. Indeed, when our bombing was cut back in March of 1968, the communists proclaimed it a victory, and a victory it really was. So now we have been negotiating in Paris for over two years, and what have the results been? Absolutely nothing. We have made concession after concession, and the North Vietnamese have offered absolutely nothing in return. They have simply used the Paris meetings as a propaganda platform from which to declare that the United States is the aggressor in the war, that we must pull out all of our troops before they will consider any meaningful negotiations. So this is what we face as a result of our all-out efforts to bring them to the conference table. What do the men who have to do the fighting think about the 
so-called peace negotiation. Right now, we have people that think that you can talk with the communists, and I think history proves that you cannot. I've looked at this enough, and I'm sure that people that are much more experienced in the field of negotiating with the communists will tell you the same thing. The only time the communists come to the peace table is when they feel that they have something to gain there or for stalling. And this means that they have more time to build up their troops in the field and to get more ammunition, more troops into the battle and play publicity and propaganda, particularly when you have a situation in this, like we have in this country now where people are expressing their opposition to the war. And of course, I can understand some of this opposition because the way the politicians have used it, they've, they've left themselves wide open for opposition. But the fact remains that the only way to stop the communist, the communist action in Southeast Asia is from a position of unassailable strength. That's the only thing they understand. To those of us who have fought in Vietnam, the peace talks have always been, at best, futile, at worst, tragic. Tragic for those soldiers in South Vietnamese who have been killed because of the improper and incorrect use of the combination of military and diplomatic means. Correct diplomacy, correct negotiations are used to shorten a war, not to prolong a war. The great statesmen that our nation has had in the past have been those statesmen with the courage and resolution to allow their military to do that job for which the military is established. Great statesmen are not people who hamstring the military and prolong the decision. Peace negotiation and peace depend on two things. One is the will of the enemy, the other is the means of the enemy. You must either destroy the enemy will or destroy the means the enemy has. Now the United States has always had the means. The men and material successfully wage the war in Vietnam and win. However, at the policy level, we have never had the desire to win. We have never had the will to win. The North Vietnamese communists, on the other hand, have never had the material or manpower to defeat the United States soldiers on the field of battle. Their leadership, however, has the will to win. They have the will, the desire, and the determination to conquer South Vietnam. Communists are determined men. They're very serious men. They're very brutal men. At this point, I think we should let General Clark tell us how he managed to get the Reds to the peace table in Korea. So after being at Panmunjom, being in charge of the negotiations there, and our people being insulted almost daily, I finally pled with my government to let me break off the negotiations at Panmunjom and place on the conference table a reasonable American position, one upon which we could sign an armistice. And finally, Washington permitted me to do so. We walked out. And then I called in my commanders, the Navy, the Air, and the Army, and we sat around for days. How could we hurt the enemy within the limitations imposed upon us? And one by one, with the exception of permission to bomb the Yalu River bridges, I had these limitations taken off. Our hands were untied. And we hit the dams, and we took out their power we hit their dams and inundated their fields. We attacked Pyongyang, the capital of North Korea, after notifying the people that we were coming. And we just pounded them until it hurt them. And then about three months later, Kim Il-sung sent me a message and said, let's go back to the conference table and let's trade prisoners of war and our sick and wounded. That's something we had asked to do many months before. So then we got down to business and began to work on an armistice. Then General Eisenhower, my old West Point comrade, came over as the president-elect. And we had our plans to present to him, and I presented them to him, how we could win the war by the use of naval and air power primarily. I'm not a believer in slugging it out man for man on the field of battle with communists, because the American GI is a very precious commodity, and the communists don't care how many of their men they kill. So not having had the determination to win that war, we got busy as I was directed and we signed an armistice. Now that armistice was violated by the communists the next day and has been violated by them ever since. And as I signed that Korean armistice, I was convinced that had we stepped out and had the courage 
to win in our first test of arms with communism and win decisively, we would not be in the predicament and the mess we find ourselves in at the present time in Vietnam. What's the answer? One political leader who hasn't kept silent is Alaskan Senator C.R. Lewis. He went to Vietnam to see for himself. Our liberal press has not seen fit to spotlight his remarks. Here they are. Well, the most brilliant military men in our country have said that we must win in Vietnam. General Mark Clark, General Al Wiedemeyer, General Paul Harkins, Admiral Sharp, the military commanders in the field have all said that there can be no satisfactory conclusion to the war in Vietnam without a military victory. We have the ships, we have the guns, we have the planes. What is lacking? We have the men, we have the courage. What is lacking is a will to win. Richard Nixon himself has said what is needed in Vietnam is a will to win. But our State Department does not have a will to win. In fact, they have said that they do not intend to win in Vietnam. One of our, one of our top advisors to uh, the president, Dr. Kissinger, has said that military victory in Vietnam is neither possible nor desirable. This fuzzy thinking, this no-win thinking, has resulted in the loss of more American lives than either World War I or Korea. It's resulted in the longest war in American history, certainly the most frustrating war in American history. The question is, is this fuzzy thinking or is it something else? With Congress rests the constitutional authority to determine foreign policy. Congress must reassert its authority and determine the foreign policy. It must require that military decisions be made by military men. Our men on the battlefield must be given the chance to win. In war, there must be victory. Some people are demanding an abrupt pull-out. They seem to believe that the Reds will stop fighting and killing at once and that there'll be instant peace. Well, let's hear again from General Harkin. If we pull out abruptly, the Reds will have a free hand, as they had when they took way in that infamous Tet Offensive. And they massacred and mutilated thousands of civilians. There will be a frightful massacre of those who have resisted communism in South Vietnam. And perhaps in the rest of the countries of Southeast Asia, such as Laos and Cambodia and Thailand, it may further open the way to infiltration and maybe attack from some of the other countries, such as Malaya, Indonesia, Australia, New Zealand, and the Philippines. The communists haven't stopped in their world offensive so far. I think it's tragic and unfortunate that the people of the United States must be constantly reminded that the communists have said they were going to surround us and they were going to bury us. They said they were going to take over Eastern Europe, and they have. They tried to come down through Greece, and we helped to stop them. They tried to come through North Korea, and with the aid of 15 other free nations, we stopped them again. They've taken over Cuba. They're very active in Latin America. And now they're come, trying to come down through Southeast Asia. I would say they're pretty well surrounding us. I think it's far better to stop them on some faraway distant shores than wait for another Pearl Harbor or perhaps to try to stop them on the shores of the United States. Tom Hayden has been called America's most decorated civilian to have served in Vietnam. He was in way after the Tet Massacre. Listen to his account of how the communists exterminate those who oppose them. Tom Hayden. A North Vietnamese regiment captured the ancient capital of Hue during the Tet Offensive in January of 1968. The North Vietnamese asked the Hue citizens to join them and oppose the Saigon government. The people of Hue said no. Then came the massacre. Over 4,000 civilian graves have been found. Many of them were buried alive. Over 1,000 people are still missing. Those in America who say that the people of South Vietnam support the communists refuse to remember Hue. They have forgotten Doc So, where over 100 mountain yards were murdered. Men, women, and children. 
Here is the latest example of the popular support the communists have in South Vietnam. Saigon. Viet Cong troops attack a South Vietnamese village south of Da Nang. The survivors of a Viet Cong invaded Barian Hamlet stated that the enemy ran through the streets shooting anyone they found, throwing grenades into their homes and into their civilian bunkers. But some of the news media would tell you that the South Vietnamese are not fighting for their freedom. That is a lie. I spent over two years with the people, and they are fighting for freedom. The way massacre should prove that many of them are dying for their freedom. We can't get out. We lead a vacuum, and in years to come, we pay 10 times the amount of blood. And if we get no response whatsoever to our stopping of the bombing and our initiatives towards peace, it may be that we will have to step up and intensify the war. And then if we do, I'm sure we'll bring the communists to the conference table, and we'll bring him fast. comes to the question of our pulling out, I think one of the most significant comments was made by General von Mixon, field commander whose troops were surrounded and forced to surrender at Dien Bien Phu. Le peuple américain ne tiendrait pas devant de tels actes de terrorisme, mais le peuple français non plus. Mais faut-il compter ce que tous sous lieutenant français savaient il y a dix ans? General von Mixon does not speak English. But in French, he made it clear to us that if the United States leaves Southeast Asia in defeat, on that day, the whole free world will begin to crumble. Ezra Taft Benson offered one solution that is, hasn't been given too much attention up to now. Mr. Benson. I recently returned from two weeks in war-threatened and war-torn Asia. The men of Vietnam who are ready to give their all in the defense of freedom who worry about reports from home of rioters, draft card burners, and other citizens many times more numerous, who seem oblivious to the threat to our freedom as they continue to enjoy their comfortable complacency. Regardless of any question of our involvement in Vietnam, we are there and we are involved. So what do we do now? We should concentrate on doing whatever is necessary to bring our boys home. But before we bring them home, we should let them finish the job most of them thought they were sent there to do. Let the communists see what good-natured Uncle Sam can still do when a bully picks a fight with him. Drop those suicidal limited political objectives and launch a massive military campaign. Topple the Hano regime and dictate rather than negotiate the peace terms. Then bring our boys home. Will this bring Red China into the war? Red China is already in the war. The best way to get her out of it is to let Chiang Kai-shek join us, as he has requested. He stands ready with 600,000 well-trained men who know how to fight under Asian conditions. Our no-win policy in Vietnam, instead of promoting peace, only sets the stage for settling the problem for the time being with a coalition government of communists and non-communists. And this virtually ensures continued war. You know, our troops overseas, they ask for so very little. And yet they give and give so very, very much. Nobody wants a war. God knows that. And especially our troops that are fighting one over there. But as long as they are fighting a war over there, the least we can do back home here is just to give them the support, the love, the dignity, and the respect that they, our flag, and our country deserve. And that's all they ask of you. Thank you. So we come back to the men who fight the battle. Or are we all involved in the battle? Listen to Captain Wilson. I went to Vietnam to fight communism. And when you get to the base of it, that's what Vietnam is all about, communist aggression. Communist aggression not only in Vietnam, but in Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, and all the areas of Southeast Asia. We have communist aggression right here in America, right in the streets every day. 
And it's evident in the newspapers if you read them closely. Wherever we can fight communist aggression, we owe it to our country to do so. Communism is America's number one enemy. It has been for years, and it will be for years to come. The only way to solve the problem in Vietnam is to take it to the base of the problem, and that is into the cities and towns of North Vietnam. We do not need to send troops into North Vietnam. The job can be done from the air. We knew it when I was over there, and we know it still today. You have to take your aircraft and the munitions at hand and go to North Vietnam and bomb the targets and the facilities that they use to wage war against the other bordering countries. This is the only thing that the communists understand. You do it from an unassailable position of strength. You let them know that you mean business. You bomb their facilities that they use to wage war. You make it so unpleasant for them at home that they have to keep their troops at home to look after the business at hand and they cannot afford to send them across other countries' borders violating the sovereignty of these countries. This is the only thing that the communists understand. It's the only way to deal with them. It cannot be done at the conference table. This is the only way to win the war in Vietnam. The choice made for us nearly 200 years ago by our founding fathers is now up for review in Vietnam and everywhere else, in the Mekong Delta and in the halls of the Congress of the United States of America. There are over 3 million Americans who have been and fought in Vietnam. We have seen communism in action. We have seen what might be termed relevant communism. We have seen Marx and Lenin taken off the library shelf and put on the backs of the people. We will never surrender to communism because we know what it is. There will be no Viet Cong in the United States of America. We will fight. We know that there is a possibility that we may not triumph. But it is not inevitable that the enemy triumph if he is opposed. There is no fate that must fall on men however they act. There is, however, a fate that falls on men if they refuse to act. We should win in Vietnam. We can win in Vietnam. We must help to extend freedom, not allow it to be foreclosed on us. This is a challenge that our generation faces. This must be our goal. Certainly we could not stand by idly and see the communists grab off chunks of the free world at will. Some place we had to stop him. And when we decided to go into Vietnam, we should have decided to go in with a determination to win that war and to win it with the might of America, mostly air and naval power. And we had the capacity to do so. Now in Vietnam, I feel in this second test of arms, having learned a lesson in Korea, if I had had the decision to make, I would have closed the port of Haiphong. I would have not permitted the paraphernalia of war from friend and foe alike to be delivered to that port to kill our men eventually. I would have attacked with air every remunerative military target in North Vietnam. I would have knocked out their railroads and inundated their rice fields and taken their dams out. And I have found that when the communists come to the conclusion that they cannot win on the field of battle what they set out to get, they run to the conference table. It is an extension of the war with them. It should be obvious by now that the predicament we're in is not the fault of the military. We should have stopped the Reds in Berlin. We should have kept them out of Cuba. We should have won the war in Korea, but we didn't. So let's not blame the men in uniform for our political mistakes. Maybe we should listen to them in time of war, and this certainly is war. They say there's no substitute for victory. Maybe we should also remember the words of Winston Churchill after Chamberlain's appeasement negotiations in Munich in 1939. Quote, the government had to choose between shame and war. They chose shame and they'll get war, unquote. They got war. Now let's take a look at our country. Today in the newspapers, on radio and TV, we read, hear, and see riots on campuses and street corners. Crime is at all-time high. We read about our American flag being hauled down by mobs, burned and stomped into the ground. We hear the names of these same mob leaders over and over from city to city. 
They wave the flag of the communist Viet Cong, the flag of the enemy that we're fighting in Vietnam, the enemy that kills our boys from ambush and fades away into political sanctuary. And at the same time here in America, the commies are allowed to teach in our schools, parade through our streets and our capital, while those in high position choose to remain silent. With all these problems, I wonder what would happen in America if we all chose to remain silent. Would crime come to a halt without preventative measures? Would the communist underground movement to take over America cease? Would the communists leave the free nations of the world alone without our help? Will they pull back across the 17th parallel in Vietnam if we withdraw our troops? The answer is no. Mr. Lincoln was right when he said that to remain silent makes cowards of men. I plead with each of you to reflect on these facts of history. Then I'd like to speak for myself. I believe we must vote out of office regardless of political party, those politicians who seek to appease tyranny and promote anarchy, and to vote for men who are responsible and who will put the welfare of our country above their own political ambition. We must stop communist rioting inside America. We must enforce the laws that make crime illegal. And if there should be another 17th parallel, we should not plead with the communists to get back, but warn them and do it only once to hell with world opinion. We must speak up and take a stand. Only then will this great nation of ours survive. Thank you.